Unless you're an experienced competitive programmer or have just done a lot of technical software interview prep, you've probably never implemented or even directly used a union find before. I believe that the union find is one of the most elegant data structures out there, and by the end of this video, I hope that you're able to appreciate its power and simplicity as well. Note that in this video, I'll assume that you're familiar with the graph data structure and basic operations on them, particularly depth first search. I'll also occasionally be using some basic set notation on screen for additional clarity, but don't worry too much if you're not familiar with it. I'll be verbally explaining everything in plain English. Let's start with an overview. The union find is a data structure that operates on a set of elements. Initially, each element is in its own subset of the larger set. The primary operation of the union find is to efficiently merge these subsets together. Note that subsets are always disjoint, meaning that an element only ever belongs to one subset at a time. And this is why the union find also has the name disjoint set. A key property of the union find is that it is queryable, meaning that you are able to quickly determine which subset an arbitrary element belongs to at any point in time. To describe this functionality in a bit more detail, the union find has two functions, union and find hence its name. Union takes two elements and merges their containing subsets into a larger subset. If the two elements are already a part of the same subset, nothing happens. Find takes one element and tells you what subset the element is in. This is done by returning the label of an element often called the representative of the subset. I'll get into what this means and how this is implemented shortly. So besides being a neat way to model sets and subsets, what good is the union find? Well, let's quickly talk about some of its most obvious use cases. Since it's queryable, it can quickly tell you if two elements are in the same subset, as also shown earlier. This problem is deeply related to many other questions, such as if two nodes in a graph are on the same component. In addition, it can tell you how many subsets you have in your larger set. This is analogous to asking how many connected components exist in a graph. Though these questions can be easily solved visually with this example, the problem becomes much more demanding when you start dealing with thousands, millions, or even more items. Nonetheless, a standard depth for search is also able to answer both of these questions, so you may ask what makes the union find special. Well, unlike a standard depth for search, the union find is able to handle dynamically updating data. So, for example, if I combine two subsets somewhere, the union find, especially when optimized, does not need to recompute much, if any, data, while a standard depth first search implementation basically needs to rescan the entire set, regardless if the answer to the given query actually changes or not. Let's talk about how the aforementioned union and find functions operate. We'll start with find. As mentioned earlier, the purpose of the find function is to return the representative element of a subset. I'll visually represent the representative element of a given subset by highlighting it in red. The representative element, which I'll call R, is a single element in the subset such that when find is called on any element within that subset, R is returned. To state it more precisely, element R is the representative of a subset if and only if for all elements in in the subset, find of n equals R. So if we look at the bottom subset in this example, if I were to call find on element 0, 3 would be returned. And if I were to call find on element 3, 3 would still be returned. In essence, the representative element is simply an item which also acts as a unique identifier for that subset. Let's talk about how this actually happens. Each element in the union find is linked to an element typically called its root or parent, which may or may not be the same as the representative element of the subset. I would depict this relationship with a line between the elements. Elements may have many children, which themselves may have their own children. However, elements may ever only have one parent. Initially, the parent of each element is itself. It's worth noting that the defining characteristic of the representative element from an implementation standpoint is that it is the only element in a subset that has its parent be itself, and this is true no matter what the size of the subset is. As you may be able to guess, when we only have one element in a subset, it is the representative element. When we begin merging subsets together, one representative element loses its representative status, but I'll get into that a little bit later. Regardless, we can use the single representative fact to figure out which item is the representative element by going up the tree, so to speak, checking if the parent of the current element is just itself. If it is, great, we found the representative element. If it isn't, keep traversing up the tree by going parent to parent. This high-level overview actually translates very nicely into a natural recursive definition for the find function. Though this is just pseudocode, real implementation in a language such as C++ or Python is barely any more complicated. As a reminder, the goal of the union function is to combine the containing subsets of two elements. Union works by first figuring out the representative elements of the arguments. 
This can be done with the find function just described. Next, it then makes the parent of one of these representative elements become the other representative element. So in this example, I can make the parent of 4 become 0, or the parent of 0 become 4. As such, the element that gets a new parent loses its status as a representative element, as its parent is no longer itself. For the most basic union find implementation, which element loses its representative status and which one keeps it isn't relevant and can be chosen arbitrarily. As was true for the find function, union also translates into code very nicely. Now that you have a general understanding of how the union find operates, let's see it in action. On screen, I'll display the code and a visualization of the union finds elements during a few union and find calls. I'll also show the mapping from child to parent so it's clear how the elements are connected. Note that the union find, as I explained it, has a number of easy optimizations. The first one is typically called path compression. To briefly explain the need, the tree-like structures created by the union find often can generate very long paths, making it such that lots of recursive calls need to be made to figure out the representative element. This basically turns the find function into a long depth for a search, which is obviously undesirable. To avoid this, we can effectively compress these long branches by recursively tying elements directly to their representative element whenever find is caught on them. The other optimization is typically called union by rank. Basically, an easy way to prevent these trees from becoming overly long is to intelligently assign representative elements on a merge. Ideally, we'd want to merge a shorter tree onto a larger tree. This makes it so that the maximum distance between an arbitrary element and its subset's representative is minimized, which has the ability to reduce runtime on subsequent find calls. And that's the union find at a basic level. Note that there are a number of things I neglected to mention in this video for the sake of brevity and to keep the video at a high level. As such, I may make a part 2 in the future, going over things like space and time complexity and more details on the optimizations. In that video, I'll also demonstrate when and how to apply the union find to some real problems. Nonetheless, I hope you found this video helpful.